Hi, thanks everybody for joining us uh, for this talk. Uh, the operator today will be Anindia Day, uh, and we're first going to go around the table to see who's attending the talk before uh, uh, Um, okay, so I'll introduce the groups now one by one. Uh, so this Akash from uh, Purdue. This Deve from Michigan. Uh, the Eric from leading the group from Columbia. Uh, this Piyush. Uh, from Caltech. Uh, we cannot see your video, but I'm assuming there's a big crowd there. Uh, there is there's a Sai here from Buffalo. And Shavas from NYU. Okay, so uh, Clemo will now introduce the speaker. Just before that, I'm just going to talk a few jokes about us. So, we have Gavin speaking uh, on TCS Plus. So, uh, just mark your calendar. It's going to be one hour earlier than the usual uh, time. Then, uh, again, two weeks later, we'll have Piotr Indyk. Um, and uh, then the last talk of the semester will be Virginia Vasilevska Williams uh, on uh, December 9. So, uh, and uh, we're very happy to have Leong talk today. Uh, Leong graduated from Columbia quite recently. Uh, then uh, did a postdoc at Simons and Berkeley and is now an assistant professor at TTY Chicago and is interested in uh, like broadly Boolean function analysis, concrete complexity, circuit. Okay, should I should I start? Uh, yes, you should start. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm going to speak about an average case depth hierarchy theorem for Boolean circuits, this joint work with Ben Rossman and Rocco Servideo. Um, this is a talk in circuit complexity. Just to recall, the broad high-level goal here is to achieve strong lower bounds on a size of circuits computing an explicit function. Uh, what do I mean by circuits? Uh, the holy grail here is to understand the, size, the class of polynomial size in or not circuits, uh, also known as p slash poly. Uh, but we are very far from this goal. This would, this would separate p from np. So the focus of research so far and of in, in this talk is on restricted subclasses of p slash poly. And in this talk, we are going to focus on one specific such subclass. We're going to focus on the class of small depth Boolean circuits. So this is the class we're interested in. It's over the basis of n or not gates. We can assume that not gates are at the bottom, although that's not very important. And we're interested in two measures. One is depth, which is the number of layers. And next is size, which is the number of gates. OK, and what do I mean by small depth Boolean circuits? So throughout this talk, let's fix the depth to be a constant, say 100. And our goal here is to have very strong lower bounds on size. We would like exponential lower bounds on size. OK, so this is a model of computation. OK, so the outline of this talk, I'll start with Hostad's theorem on the well-known theorem on parity versus constant depth or small depth circuits. I'm going to talk about two extensions, both of which were known since the 80s. Uh, the first is a so-called average case harness um, of parity versus small depth circuits. And the second is a depth hierarchy theorem. I'll explain what each of these two mean uh, in a second. And I'll get to our result, which is that we achieve both extensions simultaneously. Uh, as the title suggests, we prove an average case depth hierarchy theorem. Okay. Our result has two applications, uh, one in structural complexity and the other in Boolean function analysis, two fairly different applications, which I'll tell you about. And if I have time, and I hope to have time, I'll tell you a, a bit about our technique, uh, which is that of random projections, uh, a generalization of random restrictions. Okay. So let's start with. Uh, the first bullet, which is Hostad's theorem on parity versus small depth circuits. So this is Hostad's theorem. Uh, he gave strong exponential lower bounds against constant depth circuits. 
computing a very explicit function, the parity function of x1 to xn, a very simple, easy to describe function. Uh, in more detail, what he proved in his thesis is that for all depths d, say d equals 100, depth d circuits computing the n variable parity function require size 2 to the n to the 1 over d minus 1. So in particular, if you allow me to build a depth 100 circuit, and I have to compute the n variable parity function, I need at least 2 to the n to the 1 over 99 many gates. OK, so a very strong lower bound against a very explicit function. OK, so this is Hostad's theorem on parity versus small depth circuits. Let's talk about two extensions of Hostad's theorem. The first is average case harness. So in fact, uh, what Hostad proved is that these circuits, that these circuits of size 2 to the n over 2 to the n to the 1 over d, non, not only can they not compute parity, they, can, they cannot even approximate parity. You know, these circuits, the agreement with parity is only half plus exponentially small in n, fraction of input. So you cannot even get 51%, for example. OK, just a few notes about this. The constant 1 function, which is sort of a trivial function, a depth 0 circuit, it achieves 50% uh, agreement with parity. So what Hostad says is that if you allow me to build a depth 100 circuit, of what seems like large size, 2 to the n to the 1 over 99, I cannot do much better. I cannot even get 50.1%. OK, so hopefully it's clear that this is uh, an extension of the worst case parity versus small depth circuit result. OK, so that's extension number one. Uh, let's move to extension number two, uh, which is that uh, depth hierarchy theorem. Um, I, I need to set up some notation. First, let's recall the, the notation AC0 sub D, which is a class of depth D polynomial size circuits. So depth AC02 would be this set, would be the class of depth 2 polynomial size circuits, equivalently DNFs and CNFs. And you have depth 3, depth 4, and so on. And if you take the union of all constants, you get a class AC0, which is a class of constant depth poly n size circuits. OK, so with this notation, here's a pictorial representation of Hostad's theorem. It says that parity, which I denote by the red dot, uh, doesn't live in AC0, uh, the green circle. In particular, if you would like to compute parity with a polynomial size circuit, you need depth roughly log n over log log n, uh, in particular, non-constant. OK, and more than that, not only does he show that the red dot doesn't live in the green circle, if you'd like it to compute it with depth d circuits, you need exponential size. Okay, so that's Hostad's theorem. So here's the extension we're interested in. Consider the following challenge. I, I like the same exponential lower bound against depth d circuits as that for parity, but for a function that lives in depth d plus 1 ac0. OK, so for a hard function that is, in some sense, a lot simpler than parity. If you allow me depth d plus 1, I can compute it in AC0. But if you force me to use depth D, I, the size I need is as, as large as that required for AC0. So hopefully, intuitively, this is a more delicate task. We want the same lower bound against the same class of circuits, but against a hard function that is a lot simpler. OK? Uh, Hosa was able to do this. In the same thesis, he showed that for every depth D, there's a function FD plus 1, uh, the so-called Sipser function, which I'll tell you about, such that what FD plus 1 is simple. If you, let, if you allow me depth d plus 1, I can compute it in depth d plus 1 ac0. In fact, linear size depth d plus 1 ac0. But if you force me to use depth d, uh, any circuit, depth d circuit for fd plus 1 requires exponential size, 2 to the n to the 1 over d. Uh, just to recall, this is the same lower bound that we have for parity. OK, and a few notes. This improves on Sipser's hierarchy theorem, who used the Sipser functions to give a super polynomial separation and Yao, who, who gave an exponential separation, but not as strong. And the hard function for all these, Sipser, Yao, and Hostad's theorem, is the Sipser function, which I'll tell you about uh, in a second. Uh, be, but before telling you about the Sipser function, uh, just briefly, why is it called depth hierarchy theorem? Well, the, the, the high-level conceptual message is that depth d plus 1 circuits are much more powerful than depth d. They are depth d plus 1 circuits of linear size, so that if you even decrease the depth by 1, I have to incur an exponential blow up in size. OK? So that's the depth hierarchy theorem. Let me tell you a bit about these Sipser functions, because they're going to be important. Okay, the depth D Sipser function, the formal definition is that it's a depth D, read once, regular, alternating monotone formula. But the, the picture really speaks a thousand words. Um, you have alternating layers of n's and ors. The fan ends are regular in the sense that all n to the 1 to the n to the 1 over d. So the product of all of them would be n. It's monotone. There are no negations. Uh, the, the variables at the bottom are all x1 to xn. And it's read once, meaning you know, these, these circuits, they touch different variables. 
OK, and it's, it's easy to see that any read once formula is going to have linear size. So this, this is a depth D subserve function. OK, so just some intuition as to why the subserve function plays such an important role in depth hierarchy theorems. Consider the following. Let's consider depth 3 subserve. Um, it's again, it's a depth 3 and or depth three layers of alternating ors and ands, uh, fan in n to the one third and linear size. Okay, but now suppose you force me to compute it in depth two. What can I do? Uh, well, here's one thing I can do. I can zoom in on one sub-circuit of n and ors, n of ors, and I, can, I know that I can write every n of ors as the or of ands by the, the Morgan's law. Okay, so I can do it. I can just apply the Morgan's rule naively and write an n of ors as the or of ands, but what's the size? It's you know, n to the one third to the power n to the one third, which is roughly two to the n to the one third. Okay, but suppose I do this, and I do this for every gate, every of the n to the one third many n gates at the second level. And if I do this, what do I have? I got or of or of n's, and I can collapse the two levels of ors and get a depth two circuit. Okay, but I've paid a price. You know, the the depth three subserve function was linear size, but now after doing this, the depth two function has the circuit has size 2 to the n to the 1 third. Uh, the question is, can we do better? Well, Hostad's theorem says that this construction is essentially the best possible. This exponential blow up of going from depth 3 to depth 2 via this, what seems like a naive uh, unfolding of a DNF, a CNF, is, is unavoidable. And in fact, he proved it for you know, d plus 1 versus d. OK? So that's uh, Hostad's depth hierarchy theorem. So we have seen Hostad's theorem and two extensions. Uh, they all deal with the same class of circuits, the class of depth D circuits of size 2 to the n to the 1 over D. But they say different things. So Hosta's theorem at the bottom of the slide says that these circuits, depth D circuits of size 2 to the n to the 1 over D, they con cannot compute parity. Okay? Extension 1 says that these circuits cannot even approximate parity. So hopefully it's clear that there's an extension. Extension 2 is of a different flavor. Um, they deal with the same class of circuits, but and with worst case hardness, but it says that these circuits cannot compute a function that's much simpler than parity, a hard function that lives in depth d plus 1 ac0. OK, so this is Hosa's theorem and the two extensions. Given this picture, it seems natural to ask whether you can unify these two extensions. And indeed, Hosa asked in its thesis, he posed the following conjecture that you know these class of circuits, depth d circuits of size 2 to the n to the 1 over d, it, they, they cannot even approximate a function in depth d plus 1 computable in depth d plus 1 ac0. And our main result in this work is we confirm this conjecture of Hostad. Okay, so let me state our theorem precisely, although hopefully we can all sort of guess what the statement is. So here's our main result. Uh, it says that for every depth d, say d goes 100, there's a function fd plus 1. No surprises here, it's a Sipser function, such that what fd plus 1 is simple. If you allow me depth d plus 1 circuits, I can compute it in linear size. It's a Sipser function. But if you force me to use depth D, and even if you allow me size 2 to the n to the 1 over D, uh, these circuits have agreement with FD plus 1 only less than 51%, half plus 1 over poly n for fixed D. OK, so that's our main result. A uh, few words about it. Um, the previous work uh, was by, if you think about it, the D equals 1 case is not very interesting. The most non-trivial interesting case, the most basic non non-trivial case is D equals 2, and this was proved by O'Donnell and Wimmer in 2007. This is the starting point for us, and we build on the techniques, which I'll tell you about in the rest of this talk. OK, but before I go into the applications and our result, let me answer a question that's probably on your minds, which is, you know, this correlation bound we achieve, uh, it's only polynomially small for constant D. Uh, so a natural question is, I, I, I've told you a few slides ago that parity is exponentially hard for or constant depth circuits. Why are we not doing as well here? So I have two reasons. Um, the first is that a correlation bound, an exponentially small correlation bound is just simply not possible for the Sipser function. The Sipser function is monotone. And any monotone function, it's well known, this is not hard to see, that it's a classical result that every monotone function has one over poly n correlation with a very simple circuit, you know, either a constant function or just you know, a dictator, just x1 alone. So these are circuits of depth 1. OK. so. But that's not a very satisfactory answer. You know, try something else in depth d plus 1, some non-monotone function uh, in depth d plus 1. 
Well, my reason number two is actually it's not possible for, for any function. In fact, just sort of by the rules of the game, right? By bullet one, by the rules of the game, fd plus one has to live in depth d plus one ac zero. And it's, again, well known. Uh, it's a standard fact that every polynomial size depth d plus one circuit, it is going to have one over poly n correlation with one of the depth d circuits that feeds into its top gate. OK, so it seems like just by the rules of the game, uh, it's um, it's not possible to get a correlation bound that's significantly better than what we achieve, which is 1 over poly n. OK, great. So let me talk about two applications of result. Uh, the first is in structural complexity. So let's forget about circuits for a few slides. Uh, let's talk about higher level complexity classes. So uh, the relationship between most complexity classes is still unknown for us, like the most prominent example being does p equal mp. We're still very far from solving it, but we can ask the following variant. Um, I think this is inspired by mathematical logic, in particular recursion theory. Uh, we can imagine a world where algorithms have you know, magical access to an oracle called A. It computes a Boolean function. Think of A as, say, three set. So what, what does this oracle give me? I give it a three set instance, and in unit time, it tells me whether you know, the three set instance is satisfiable or not. And, and you can ask, in this, in this, in this world, um, this is not the world we live in, at least not that we know of, but we can still ask, in this world where you have oracle access to this function, does p equal to np? Uh, the notation we use here is does p to the a equal np to the a? Okay? And then we have actually had a lot of success in answering this question. So even back in 1975, in a paper that introduced uh, this notion of relativization and complexity theory, it was shown that p is not equal to np for some oracle a. And a few years later, Bennett and Gill should give stronger evidence that, in fact, p is not equal to np for almost every oracle a. OK? So this is a somewhat satisfactory solution to you know, the p versus np question in other worlds. We know that you know, there's some world out there for which p is not equal to np, and not just that, for almost every other world out there, p is not equal to np. OK, so let's move on to other questions beyond p versus np. Uh, that's the polynomial hierarchy. This is a natural generalization of p and np. p sits at the zeroth level. And np sits at the first level. And just like how np generalizes p for every integer k, the k plus first level generalizes the kth level. Okay? And just as we believe that p is not equal to np, a uh, widely believed conjecture is that all levels of the ph are distinct. Or we say you know, the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. So not only is the first level distinct from the zeroth level, not only do we believe that np is not equal to p, we believe that the second level is distinct from the first level, and so on and so forth. So this is obviously a stronger conjecture and p is not equal to np, and we are still far from solving it. And just like p not equal to np, if it's true that the ph is infinite, there are many nice consequences, a few prominent examples being that you know, the p slash poly is not equal to np. This is a classical result of Karp and Lipton, and also that graph isomorphism is not np-complete. OK. So let me talk more about the polynomial hierarchy. So here are two statements we believe are true about the polynomial hierarchy. The first is that pH is not equal to p space. And the second is what we talked about in the last slide, that pH is infinite. I don't have time to go into the details of the first or second bullet, but for this talk, it's just sufficient to know that 2 implies 1, which is a well-known and standard result. OK, so these are two statements we believe are true about the pH, but we are still far from you know, uh, proving them. But we can ask the same questions as we did about p versus np. Uh, is this true? Do these separations hold relative to an oracle? Is it true in some world out there? And if so, we can ask for stronger evidence. Is it true in most worlds out there? Is it true relative to almost every oracle? OK, and just like p versus np, we've had quite a bit of success answering these questions. So let's start with the first statement, which is that pH is not equal to p space uh, relative to some oracle and relative to al almost all oracles. Back in the 80s, Yao and Hostad showed that you know, the first separation, that pH is not equal to p space, it holds for some oracle A. A few years later, Tai and Babai showed that, in fact, pH is not equal to p space for almost every oracle A. So again, this is a somewhat satisfactory answer to the first, first question. So let's move on to the second one, which is the strongest statement that pH is infinite. Yao and Hostad also showed that pH is infinite relative to some oracle A. And so the third bullet implies the first. Um, and as for whether it's infinite relative to almost all oracles, this was left as a conjecture by Hostad, Tsai, and Baba in the 80s. And as a consequence of our work, uh, we confirmed this conjecture. And I'd like to tell you that this, uh, I'd like to explain why this is a 
direct consequence of our circuit result. And in fact, all three bullets above are, are also consequences of circuit results. So let me touch on this connection between small depth circuits and the relativized polynomial hierarchy for a few more slides. OK? So we know of the 80s as a very exciting time for studying circuit complexity, especially for AC0. And you know, one of the main motivations uh, for studying AC0 was this connection uh, between AC0 circuits, constant depth circuits on the left of the slide, and the relativized polynomial hierarchy on the right. This was established by First, Sex, and Sipser in 1981. I don't have time to go into the details of this connection too much, but I just want to say that it's quite straightforward, and the connection is actually very tight. Uh, we can think of pH as statements of the sort, for all x, there exists a y, such that for all z, a constant number of alternating quantifiers. And this corresponds exactly to the fact that AC0 is a class of circuits that goes, there are the ands of ors of ands of ors, a constant many times. Okay, so there's a direct translation between AC0, depth dAC0, and the dth level of the polynomial hierarchy. Okay? And this connection allows us to translate lower bounds against constant depth circuits into lower bounds against the relativized pH. So let me just spend one more slide on that. So a few slides ago, we saw Hostad's theorem and two of its extensions. One is to average case hardness, and the other is to a depth hierarchy. Uh, thanks to this first sex sipsa connection, there's actually a mirror image of results in uh, structural complexity that corresponds to each of these theorems and the extensions. So Yao's and, Yao and Hostad's theorem showing that parity is not in AC0 implies that pH is not equal to P space for some oracle A, thanks to the first sex Simpson connection. The first extension to average case hardness implies that, in fact, pH is not equal to P space for almost every oracle A. Extension number two, uh, which is sort of of a different flavor to establish a depth hierarchy theorem for AC0, corresponds to the fact that pH is infinite for some oracle A. And hopefully this makes intuitive sense. You know, the a depth hierarchy for circuits, pH being infinite sort of feels like a depth hierarchy for pH. Okay? And just like how we can ask for, we can conjecture about a average case depth hierarchy theorem that extends both extension one and unifies both extension one and extension two, we also have this conjecture in the mirror image showing that pH is infinite for almost all oracles, which would which would imply time Barbie's result on pH not equals P space for almost all oracles A. And also on the right, that pH is infinite for some oracle A. And as a consequence of our result, our circuit result, which, give, which we give an average case depth hierarchy theorem, via this, this first sex Sipsa connection, we confirm this conjecture of Hostad, Chai, and Babai showing that pH is, in fact, infinite for almost every oracle A. Okay, so I just wanted to mention this first application to structural complexity. Uh, let's switch gears and talk about a different application in Boolean function analysis. Uh, but before I do that, any questions? Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, I actually have one small question, but it's, yeah. a, it's about the statement. So you phrase it in terms of AC, AC0, but like, is there anything special about D being a constant or the same? Oh, okay. term? Yeah, so um, Hosa's result can be said as showing that you know parity is not in AC0, but in fact, it gives lower bounds for super constant D as well, up to log n over log log n. Uh, and our result, uh, we do not have it up to log n over log log n, but we have it up to square root log n. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, these results, they typically hold not just for every constant d, but you know, for d being a slow-growing function uh, of n. So these are lower bounds, not just against constant depth circuits, but against small depth circuits. OK, thanks. Yes. Yeah, good question. Right. OK, so let's move on to the second application in Boolean function analysis. Uh, so let's start with a very fundamental fact about circuits. Uh, but first, fix a function f. This has nothing to do with circuits yet. Fix a Boolean function f and consider the following very simple random experiment. First, draw a uniform random input x. It's going to look like this, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and so on and so forth. And then flip a uniform random coordinate. Flip, if it's 1, flip it to 0, and if it's 0, flip it to 1. And you get a string called the resulting string y. So x and y are correlated strings. that They differ only in one coordinate. OK, and I'd like to ask the following question. What's the probability? probability that f of x is not equal to f of y. Uh, in particular, I can define the influence of a function. This is also known as the average sensitivity of a function to be n multiplied by this probability that f of x differs from f of y. Uh, this factor of n, do not worry too much about it. It's sort of a matter of convention. But if you allow me to multiply by n, then that, that brings influence to a number between 0 and n. So for every Boolean function f, I can ask, what's its influence? Is it low? Is it close to 0? 
or is it high? Is it close to n? Okay. And a theorem of linear Mansour and Nissan that was sharpened by Bupana shows that if you promise me that f has a certain structure, if f is computed by a size s depth d circuit, s influence is low. Its influence is bounded by log s to the d minus 1. So how should we read this? Again, in this talk, let's think of s as a polynomial size, poly n, and depth d as constant. So LMN, a consequence of LMN says that the influence of constant depth polynomial size circuits is poly log n. Okay, so in the spectrum of 0 and n, we think of constant depth circuits as falling closer to 0. They are low influence functions. Okay, so that's the theorem of Lino, Mansour, and Nissan. Um, very briefly, here are some functions um, and its influences. We start on the right with parity, which is the world's most influential function. It's not hard to see that the influence of parity is n. Um, it's closely followed by a random function, which also has very high influence, roughly n over 2. And for majority, if you work out the numbers, its influence is roughly root n. Uh, for this talk, let's think of it as high. And on the left, we have low influence functions that are very structured and not very interesting. You start with the constant function, which has influence 0. The x1 function, the so-called dictator function, has influence 1. Tribes, which is a very simple DNF, has influence log n. And if you notice, you know, the functions on the right, majority, random function, and parity, are canonical examples of function that, functions that are not in AC0. And Lina Mansour Nissan says that this is not a coincidence. OK, if you have size s depth d circuits, in particular if you have, say, quasi-polynomial size, not just polynomial, and a constant depth circuits, then LMN says that your total influence is to the left of poly log n. In particular, LMN implies that majority, a random function, and parity is not in AC0. OK, so this is, this, this is the LMN bound on the total influence on circuits. A theorem, um, a question has been asked, uh, starting from the paper of Benjamini, Kalai, and Shrum, and repeated in various forms of O'Donnell, Kalai, and Hotami, is whether a converse to Lina, Mansour, and Nissan is true. So what does that mean? Well, LMN says that constant depth circuits of small size, polynomial size, they have low influence. These questions they ask, you know, is a converse true? Is it true that low influence functions are essentially small depth circuits, constant depth circuits of small size? Notice that if this is true, it will be quite a nice characterization of low influence function. It essentially says that you have low influence if and only if you look like a constant depth circuit of polynomial size. Okay, so this is a question that's been floating around for a while. Uh, again, the pictorial representation is, LMN says that if you have polynomial size or even quasi-polynomial size and constant depth, if you are such a circuit, then you'd lie to the left of poly log n in terms of your influence. So th these questions they ask, is the converse true? If you lie to the left of poly log n, are you well approximated? Are you very close to a quasi-poly n size constant depth circuit? Okay, um, again, if true, this would be a very nice characterization of poly log n influence functions. But as a consequence of our main result, we showed that unfortunately this is not true. Our main result gives a strong counterexample to this conjecture. We give, we construct log n influence functions such that even if you allow me super constant depth, Coming back to Clement's question, uh, even if you allow me depth, you know, square root log n, and even if you allow me size that's significantly bigger than quasi-polynomial size, the agreement of any such circuit with our log n influence function is less than 51%. And I don't have the time to, to go through why this follows as a consequence of our depth hierarchy theorem, but it's really quite a simple direct consequence of our depth hierarchy theorem. Okay, so that's the second application. Just to recap, we have two two applications of result uh, of different flavors. The first is in structural complexity, showing that pH is infinite relative to a random oracle. And the second is in Boolean function analysis uh, that shows, that unfortunately, it seems like there's no approximate converse to this very nice theorem of linear Mansour nissan given, giving a bound on the total influence of constant depth circuits. OK, so for the rest of this talk and my remaining time, I'd like to tell you about uh, how we prove our result. In particular, I'd like to tell you about this method of random, well-known method of random restrictions. Uh, the difficulties in applying it in our setting, and how our techniques overcome these difficulties. OK, but before moving on, uh, any questions? OK, let's keep going. So in more detail, the rest of this talk is going to be structured as follows. Um, we start again with this picture. Uh, I, I'll start with a very high level, brief overview of Hostad's proof that parity is not in AC0. I'll tell you why extension 1 sort of follows quite easily from his technique. Average case harness follows quite easily from the proof that parity is not in AC0. 
And more interestingly, I'd like to tell you why extension 2, a uh, depth hierarchy theorem, does not follow easily. Um, there's, you know, a conceptual difficulty in proving a depth hierarchy theorem using the techniques that was used to prove parity versus AC0. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll then tell you about Hostas' proof of extension 2 and why it sort of breaks extension 1, that his proof of a depth hierarchy theorem doesn't establish average case hardness. I like to get across this tension between extension 1 and extension 2. The proof technique that gives you average case hardness has trouble establishing a depth hierarchy theorem, and a proof technique that gives you a depth hierarchy theorem doesn't yield average case hardness. And finally, I'll tell you about how our techniques uh, overcome these difficulties. OK, so let's start with you know, the structure of Hostad's basic proof that parity requires exponential size AC0 circuits. His technique, um, first his technique, is the well-known method of random restrictions. That's just to recall, given a Boolean function f, what's a random restriction? A random restriction, if you hit f, you get a simpler Boolean function, which I'll denote by f sub rho. It is, of course, very vague, but I'll make it precise uh, in the next slide. But I just want to say that this was introduced by Subloskaya uh, in the context of circuit complexity in the 60s. And till today, it's really just an indispensable tool in circuit complexity. Hosta uses it heavily, and we built very heavily on this method of random restrictions. So what's a random restriction in more detail? Uh, consider the following experiment. Think of there's a parameter p between 0 and 1, which we should think of as small. Think of p as, say, 0 0.1, or even 1 over log n. And generate the string rho, a uh, string in 0, 1 star, as follows. Independently for every coordinate, uh, with probability p, put down a star. And otherwise, if flip a fair coin between 0 and 1 and put it down and generate this string row. So the string you see is a string of 0, 1s, and stars with roughly pn fraction of stars. And the 0s and 1s, the non-star coordinates are roughly split equally between 0s and 1s. OK, so this is what a restriction is. How do we apply this restriction row to a function? Well, the restriction of a Boolean function f by this string row is the function f sub row, which is a function over the stars. So you take in inputs for the stars. And for the non-star, coordinates, you fill it in according to the template row that you generated. OK, so hopefully it's clear that this is at least a simpler function. For one, it's over pn, roughly pn coordinates rather than all n coordinates. But the key, again, is how much simpler. OK, but this is what a random restriction is. OK, so given this, how does Hostad prove his theorem? Well, just to recall again, this picture, Hostad's theorem says that parity, the red dot, doesn't li live in AC0, the green circle. How would you prove that? Well, he hits, you hit AC, you hit parity, the red dot, with a random restriction. You hit AC0, the green circle, with a random restriction. And you prove that two different things happen to them. If you can do that, then clearly the red dot cannot live in the green circle. OK, so in more detail, you hit parity with a random restriction. And you argue that it remains complex, with some notion of complex. It becomes parity on fewer variables. And two, if you hit AC0, the green circle, with a random restriction, you argue that it collapses to a simple function, a so-called small depth decision tree, which actually falls in AC02. It's even simpler than AC02. So it's right in that most inner circle. And then what's the end game? The punchline is that simple functions cannot compute complex functions. You argue that small depth decision trees cannot compute parity. OK, so that's a high-level proof structure. And just a quick remark, out of these three, the first, that parity, when hit by a random restriction, becomes remains complex is a very simple consequence, basically by the definition of parity and a random restriction. Item three, that you know, simple functions cannot compute complex functions, that small depth decision trees cannot compute parity, is an easy exercise. So the real work uh, comes in showing that AC0 collapses to a simple function under random restrictions. And this is precisely Hostad's switching lemma. So let me quickly spend one slide on that. So Hostad's main technical ingredient shows that if you hit AC0, the green circle, with a random restriction, it collapses to a simple function, a decision tree. And how does he prove it? He proves it using his famous switching lemma, which shows that under a random restriction with you know, the appropriate star probability p, the depth of AC0 circuits decreased by at least 1. So if you hit an AC0 circuit d times, a depth d AC0 circuit d times, it'll collapse down to a very simple function. OK, so this is how he proves item 2, that AC0 collapses to a simple function. OK. So we just sketched at a very, very high level the proof of Hostad's first theorem showing that depth d circuits computing the n variable parity function require exponential size, 2 to the n to the 1 over d. 
And actually, I claim that the proof, this proof technique, sort of implicitly establishes average case hardness. And you know, out of this proof technique, we get as a quite a simple consequence the fact that we we have average case hardness that these circuits, that these circuits of size two to the n to the one over d, the agreement with parity is not just less than 100 percent; it's less than 51 percent. Okay, so let me tell you about the key property we need of the random restriction that gives extension one quite easily. The key fact we need is that restrictions sort of complete to the uniform distribution. What do I mean by that? Uh, consider the following random experiment. Again, generate rho, as I described a few slides ago, this string rho in 0, 1 star with probability p, put down the star. Otherwise, flip a fair coin independently for every coordinate. And second, fill in the stars with 0 and 1 uniformly at random. Okay, and then after step one and step two, you get just a zero one string. So what's the obvious fact? Uh, the obvious fact is this string is uniform random. Well, hopefully that's clear. Well, in stage one, if you do not put down a star, you flip a fair coin. And if you do put down a star, you fill it in with a fair coin in step two. So it's, it's very obvious that a uniform, the string is uniform random. But th this is, although this is obvious, it's really the crucial fact and why the restrictions give you average case hardness. It's sort of it's hiding a uniform random string. Or in other words, when you apply a random restriction to a function, you're implicitly feeling it part of a uniform random string. So this is why um, the proof using the method of random restrictions gives you average case hardness against parity. OK, so let's move on. So what have we shown? We have recalled at a very high level the structure of Hostas theorem showing that parity requires huge AC0 circuits. We've argued why extension 1, average case hardness, that follows quite easily. And let's get to the interesting part, why extension 2, a depth hierarchy theorem, worst case depth hierarchy theorem, does not follow easily from this proof technique. OK, so here's our favorite picture again, Hostas theorem and its proof, parity. The red dot doesn't live in AC0, the green circle. How do you prove it? You hit parity with a random restriction. You argue it remains complex. You hit AC0 with a random restriction. You argue it collapses to a simple function. And you argue that simple functions cannot compute complex functions. So this is a proof that parity is not in AC0. What's the high level conceptual difficulty in proving a depth hierarchy theorem? The proof sort of breaks, at least for these random restrictions, since by the rules of the game, your hard function has to lie in AC0. It has to lie in depth d plus 1 AC0. So in some sense, there's you know, this incompatibility between the two proof techniques. And because you know, the, two, the two theorems are just fundamentally different. So on one hand, for parity versus AC0, you have to, you want to separate parity from AC0. Your random restrictions has to destroy all of AC0. On the other hand, in the depth hierarchy theorem, you're trying to separate depth d plus 1 from depth d. So you have to preserve the function in depth d plus 1, just by the rules of the game. So uh, it just, it seems like you just cannot apply this proof technique, at least with these random restrictions, to prove a depth hierarchy theorem. But Hosta was able to get around it. And here's what he did. His fix was that he introduced new random restrictions, now blue in color instead of yellow, uh, that designed specifically for the Sipser function. Uh, it was designed specifically with the Sipser function in mind. And what does he prove that these new random restrictions satisfy? Well, if you hit Sipser with this new random restriction, it remains complex. And he proves that his switching lemma still holds for these new random restrictions, that if you hit the AC0 depth D circuit, it collapses to a simple function. Okay, and given these new random restrictions, which again are more delicate, right? It preserves a function in AC0, you're able to separate depth D plus one versus depth D AC0. Okay. So a quick slide about the difference, again, this difference between the two, two theorems we have seen, both due to Hostad. The first is that parity is not in AC0. And in some sense, the, the picture on the right, the task on the right is a slightly more delicate task. Right? Roughly speaking, in parity versus AC0, parity is very resilient towards random restrictions. You can hit it really hard, and it still remains complex. Whereas the challenge that comes in on the right picture in the depth hierarchy theorem is that your target function, fd plus 1, which by the rules of the game has to live in depth d plus 1 AC0, is fragile. Right? So you have to be, it, it's a more delicate task. Another way to put it is that you know, these two theorems say sort of different things. On the left, it's a lower bound against the computational power of all of AC0. You'd like to prove that all of AC0 is a weak class. And on the right, you're tr trying to carve up AC0 into infinitely many classes of increasing computational power. So these are two slightly different tasks. 
But also, Leah, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, suppose uh, one considers random restrictions where the row is not set to whatever it's set to, like constant or something. Right. Um, but one considers like a smaller row. Um, I mean, will it be okay? So let me uh, let me ask a question. So, uh, just using random restrictions, would it be possible to prove a separation between depth d and depth two d circuits, something like that? That's a great question. Uh, the answer, well, first of all, even depth d and d plus one, you can use the method of random restrictions to get a super polynomial separation, but it wouldn't be as yeah. I didn't mention this in my talk, but just using parity scale down so that it, by definition, it lives in depth d plus one ac zero you get a super polynomial separation between depth D and D plus 1. But for both our applications, we need an exponential separation. OK, so that's answer number one, that even with random restrictions, you can separate D versus D plus 1, but a very weak separation. And this is what Sipser did. And question, uh, the second, part, second answer to your question is that if you like an exponential separation, as, we, as Hostad did and as we achieve, even it doesn't seem any easier to get d versus 2 to the d, or d versus d squared. In fact, that's something we tried for a long time. We're like, OK, let's just get a d versus 2d separation. Let's get a d versus d squared separation. But it, it didn't seem that that was much easier. Yeah. OK, so let's move on. So anyway, Hosta was able to achieve both of these pictures. But he sort of paid a price. The price that we pay is that we only get worst-case worst harness for the picture on the right. Uh, recall this key fact about usual restrictions, th these yellow colored random restrictions that, that we saw from a few slides ago. They're very nice. They are very simple. They're independent across coordinates. And hence, it sort of hides a uniform random string. And hence, you know, any, any separation you prove using the yellow, the, the standard random restrictions, it, it easily gives you average case hardness, as we get for parity versus AC0. But Hosad's new SIPSA restrictions, let's call them SIPSA restrictions because they really are designed just for this SIPSA functions. The coordinates are carefully correlated to keep SIPSA complex because this is what you need uh, to separate SIPSA at depth d plus 1 from AC0 circuits of depth d. And as a consequence of the fact that these coordinates are so carefully correlated to keep SIPSA complex, you, you do not process every coordinate independently. The distribution, the resulting dis string you get is supported on exponentially small subset of inputs. It's not the case that every input has an equal chance of coming up as part of your restriction. And hence, what you get is worst case. At a very high level, this is why you only get a worst case depth hierarchy theorem and not an average case depth hierarchy theorem. Okay, So let me just quickly summarize what we have said so far. There are three requirements for an average case depth hierarchy theorem. First, you would like to separate SIPSR at depth d plus 1 from AC0 circuits of depth d. Right, that's what we need for a depth hierarchy theorem. So you need a random restriction that keeps SIPSA complex, your heart function complex, and you need a, you need a random restriction that, that collapses anything that's even slightly simpler than SIPSA, depth DAC0 circuits. So this will give you a depth hierarchy theorem, but you like an average case depth hierarchy theorem, so you have your restrictions has to complete to the uniform distribution. Okay, and what do we have? What's the challenge that we faced when we started this project? Well, one is that the usual restrictions, the yellow colored ones, they satisfy two and three, but not one. They satisfy two, thanks to the switching lemma, showing that AC0 circuits collapse to a simple function under these usual random restrictions. They're very simple and well-behaved. They are independent across coordinates, so they complete the uniform distribution. But sort of just by the fact that they destroy AC, you're separating parity from AC0, they designed to destroy all of AC0, and in particular, they destroy the hot function for a depth hierarchy theorem. OK, so this doesn't work for us. But Hostad said, no problem. Here are new random restrictions, blue in color. They are designed to satisfy one. They keep SIPSR complex. He still proves a switching lemma for these new blue colored random restrictions. AC0 circuits under these blue colored random restrictions, just like our usual random restrictions, they collapse to a simple function. And hence, he gets a depth hierarchy theorem. But the, the coordinates are carefully correlated to keep SIPSR complex which is why he doesn't get an average case depth hierarchy theorem. Okay? And in this work, uh, what we do to prove an average case depth hierarchy theorem is that we achieve all three, but not using random restrictions by this notion of random projections, which I'll tell you about in my remaining time. OK? So, but any questions? Uh, yeah, one more question. So are these random projections at all related to like what uh, Hostad was doing in his? Uh... Yeah. yeah. Um, he doesn't use projections, he uses restrictions, but our projections share 
similarities with its restrictions. And it's sort of expected because our heart function is also SIPSER. Like the heart function for us and for him is SIPSER. And just like him, our random projections are designed specifically with SIPSER in mind to keep SIPSER complex. And likewise, his random restrictions. Uh, but you know, as I'll say in, the, in my next few slides, there's a key ingredient in our projections, the notion of projections that doesn't appear in, in his random restrictions. OK. Yeah. Is, it clear, is it clear that random restrictions cannot work? I mean, it, it, does that even make sense yeah. to say? Like, yeah, I think we can argue that random restrictions uh, will not be able to achieve all three. Right. So this notion of projections of, you know, as, as I'll say, grouping variables together really seems crucial to get an average case depth target here. Yeah. OK, so let me tell you what projections are and give you a very high level quick sketch of how we prove our theorem. So our technique is, as I said, random projections, a generalization of random restrictions. So what are random projections? Well, recall what a restriction is. Here's another way of saying it. Each variable xi is either set to constant, is either killed, set to 0 or 1, or it survives, uh, meaning it's still xi. So in other words, you can think of a random restriction as mapping every xi to either a constant, 0 or 1, or just xi itself. Sometimes we denote that as star. A projection, on the other hand, maps each xi either to a constant, like in a restriction, or here's a crucial difference to a new formal variable from a new space of formal variables. So every xi either goes to 0 and 1, like a restriction, or yj from some new space of formal variables, y1 to ym. Okay? So one thing that we can do with a projection that we are unable to do with a restriction is map x1 and x5 to y2. Right? We can group x variables to the same new formal variable. And this is something we cannot do with restriction. OK, and indeed, our proof, we use uh, the projections we employ. The y variables are much smaller than the x variables. And distinct x variables are going to collide to the same y variable, depending on the structure of the SIPSER formula. And hopefully, again, it's clear that you know, this is something that we, we are not able to do with restrictions. OK, so let me tell you a bit about our proof. So I'm going to sketch a weaker bound, a 3D versus D separation via a conceptually easier argument, but it's going to capture most of the ingredients that we use to separate D plus 1 versus D. OK. So our random projections, just like host starts random restrictions, these are, we really can call them SIPSER random projections because they are designed with the SIPSER formula in mind. So this is a hard function. We like to keep it complex. And again, recall that a SIPSER formula is read once. You know, it's, say, let's assume that the gates at the bottom are N gates. And every end gate touches distinct variables. And let's zoom in on the jth end gate, which touches x1 to xw. And again, this really should be called x, xj1, xj2 to xjw, because no other end gates touch them. What's our random projection? It does the following. For every such end gate, the jth end gate, it maps every variable xi that sits below the jth end gate, either to 1 or to yj, where j is the name of the gate. OK, so you see a string that's 1, 1, 1, yj, 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 1, yj, 1, 1. OK, so hopefully, again, it's clear that this is something you cannot do with restrictions. And what's the distribution over this row? It's drawn from 1, yj to the w, independently for every coordinate. Put down a 1 or yj with probability 1 half, but condition on not, not, not getting 1 to the w. So it's almost independent, but not quite. You condition out. The, the event of getting 1 to the w. OK, and roughly speaking, why do we want to do this? I'll cover this in the next slide. But roughly speaking, we would like to keep uh, SIPSER complex. So why do, we, why do we only put down 1s and not zeros? Because we, we, we want to preserve the end gate. Uh, putting down a 0 would kill the end gate. So we, our distribution is supported on just 1 and yj is no zeros. That's one thing. Why do we condition out 1 to the w? Well, again, we want to keep the end gate alive. So we do not want to put down the all one string, which would, again, satisfy the end gate. So it's set up so that the SIPSER function remains complex. In particular, what happens is that the end, jth end gate under this random projection is going to be the end, right? The end of 1 just disappears. The 1 just disappears. So it's going to be the end of a non-empty set of yj's, which is just yj alone. So with probability 1, if you hit our SIPSER formula with random projection, it becomes a SIPSER formula of 1 less with probability 1. OK. But I'll come to that in the next slide. That, that was just looking ahead. So our overall, this is how we, how we hit our circuit when the bottom layer are N gates. If the bottom layer are OR gates, as will happen in the next level, 
we just do a dual distribution for all gates. In particular, we only put down zeros and ZJs, where J is the name of the OR gate. And again, we switch variables. We go from X variables to Y variables to Z variables to Z prime variables, so and so forth. And this is the notion of random projections. OK, so this, this is our random projection. Hopefully, it's clear. Uh, and again, recall, I have to prove three things about these random projections. One, that it keeps SIPSR complex, but we basically already sketch the proof of that. And it's not hard, because they were designed to keep SIPSR complex. Two, we have to prove that unlike SIPSR of depth 3D, AC0 circuits of depth D, if you hit it with a random projection, they collapse to a simple function. And also, most interestingly, perhaps, that I have to argue to you that I'm the, these random projections complete to the uniform distribution, which is not clear at all, because if you recall the random projections, it's only put down ones and no zeros. So, but I'm claiming that if you compose it, the, the resulting string is going to be a uniform random string of zeros and ones. So, but we'll get to that. But let's with, start with the easiest one, which is item number one, that you know, our SIPSA, SIPSA projections keep SIPSA complex, which is designed to do. But again, we sort of already sketched the proof. Recall that row is drawn from this distribution that only puts down ones and yj's, no zeros, and furthermore, never puts down one to the w. So just because we condition out one to the w, and also, I didn't write this, but also because we do not put down any zeros, the end gate is never killed. It always simplifies with probability one to the n of a non-zero subset of yj's. And the n of a non-zero subset of yj's is just yj alone. So Again, what happens when you hit the depth 3D subsurf formula with a random projection? With probability 1, it snaps to a depth 3D minus 1 subsurf formula with OR gates at the bottom, a perfect copy of it. Okay, so, and again, the, this shouldn't be a surprise because our random projections were designed to do this. Okay, but good. Uh, let's go to skip requirement 2. Let's go to what's perhaps the most interesting one that, you know, that sort of these random projections implicitly hide a uniform random string, which is uh, not clear, I guess. Well, again, recall, what's the distribution? For every coordinate with probability independently with for every coordinate, put down either a 1 or yj, but not independently because we condition on not getting 1 to the w. OK, so that's what we see on the screen is actually a string that comes out of this process as 1s and yj's, and I guess slightly more yj's. And <laughs> the worry here is that I promise you that these strings are going to complete the uniform distribution, but this doesn't look uniform at all. Where are the zeros? I think this is a, a place in which projections really come in. By the fact that we have grouped different xi's to the same yj, if we flip a coin for yj with sufficient bias, the resulting string is going to snap to a uniform random string. And so the elementary, this is really a three or four line proof, but it's really a crucial fact for us, and this was in the work of O'Donnell and Wimmer, is the following fact, that if you ge generate rho as follows, you generate just 1s and yj's from this non-product distribution. Now flip one coin for the, all the resulting yj's, but it's very biased towards 0. It's 0 with probability 1 minus 2 to the minus w, and 1 with otherwise. The resulting string is uniform. So there's something we can verify easily, but let's just check. What's the probability of getting the all one string? Well, after the first stage, you will never get the all one string. You only get you know, part of the way there. You get some ones and yj's. And what you have to do in the second stage, what, what does y to get a one string? Well, yj has to be one. So the probability of getting the all one string is 2 to the minus w. OK. So again, yeah, sort of, I'd like to dwell on this a little more, because I, I really think that this is the key observation that, um, that allowed everything to go through. If you ask me to generate a uniform random string, what can I do? Well, probably what I'll do is I'll flip an independent coin, one zero coin, for every coordinate. And I'll get a uniform random string. What this says is that you can think of it as a two-stage process, neither of which looks uniform at all. The first thing you do is to put down ones and stars, or yj's. And then you group all the stars together, or you call them all yj. And you flip one coin for the resulting yj variable. So this is the notion of projections. And the string you get out is uniform random. OK, so informally, rho, which is, again, a non-product distribution, composed with this 2 to, the minus, 2 to the minus w bias product distribution over these yj variables, gives you a uniform string. OK? So what does requirement? So we have covered requirement 1 and requirement 3. Requirement 1 saying that SIPSR just goes down by depth 1. And requirement 3 saying that you know the resulting string is uniform random. 
it allows us to say that you know the SIP serial, our heart function preserves structure in some sense. So this is our heart function, depth 3D SIPSER formula with N gates at the bottom. And recall our goal is to prove that it's hard to approximate with respect to the uniform distribution. Hit it with our random projection. We have seen that with probability 1, the depth 3D formula goes down to depth 3D minus 1 with OR gates at the bottom. And thanks to this O'Donnell-Wimmer fact, um, our task of proving uniform distribution hardness for the circuit on the left is translated into the task of proving uniform distribution two to the minus W bias product distribution hardness for the picture on the right. So it sort of preserves the structure of our heart instance, both respect, with respect to how the circuit looks and also with respect to the distribution that we're working with. Okay, so that's our heart function. We have to say something about circuits that, can, uh, that tries to compute these guys. So I've sort of covered item one, which is that SIPSER remains complex. And sort of the restrictions, if you compose them, the, the resulting string you get is uniform random. I have to argue that AC0 depth D circuits, unlike SIPs of depth 3D, they do not remain complex. They collapse to a simple function. And I, I will not go into detail, but just to quickly recall, um, the key ingredient in, in Hostad's uh, proof of parity not in AC0 is this restriction switching lemma showing that AC0 circuits, if you hit it with a random restriction, it, its depth reduces by one, and you apply it d times, you get a decision tree. For the random projections that we have described, it's actually not true that AC0 circuits are going to collapse. Uh, the depth is going to go down by one under our random projections. What we can prove is that if you hit it three times, if you do one and yj's, and then zero and zj's, and then you know one and yj primes again, that you know the depth of AC0 circuits go down by one. So this difference between 3 and 1 is why I've only sketched a 3D versus D separation and not a D plus 1 versus D separation. Okay? But just, this, I'm coming to the end of my talk. So what do we do to improve to D versus D minus 1 or D plus 1 versus D? Well, we have to change our random projections so that it's more powerful. It's, it's better suited to destroying AC0 depth D circuits. And yet, it still keeps SIP0 of depth D plus 1 complex. So it's a different and significantly more delicate random projection to en ensure that AC0 circuits has depth reduction after just one projection rather than three projections. But again, like um, whenever you tweak, we have tweaked our random projections, we have to ensure that the two, two other properties which we have sketched and which are actually very easy for, for the, we have essentially sketched a proof in this talk. We have to check that they're still maintained under these new random projections. And but just because we have changed it and it's, it's different. Um, these other two properties are trickier to maintain. So it really feels like juggling three balls. Uh, if you tweak your random projections so that they satisfy one of the three properties, it makes it harder to satisfy you know, two properties. And you, you, you want to find a delicate balance where you can get all three properties. Okay, just to wrap up, the summary of our approach, again, is this is really the structure of our paper. We design random projections, orange in color, and argue that they satisfy the three requirements. We have to prove that. SIPSER of depth D plus 1 remains complex under our random projections. That AC0 circuits of depth D, unlike SIPSER of depth D plus 1, they collapse to a simple function. And again, when you compose them, um, the resulting string you get out is uniform random. I just want to mention that all three parts require significant work. And it's not just that they require significant work. There's sort of pairwise tension between all three. Right? Hopefully, the pairwise tension between 1 and 2 is clear. Uh, any random projection that collapses AC0 circuits are less likely to keep SIPSER complex. And if you tweak it to make it more likely to keep SIPSER complex, you know, it's probably harder to prove a switching lemma showing that depth D circuits collapse. But, you know, we, yeah, we, we were able to find the, the random projection that, that achieved all three. Okay, so just to summarize, in this talk we have seen an average case depth parity theorem for Boolean circuits. It's sort of a generalization of two extensions of Hostad's theorem showing that parity requires large AC0 circuits. There are two applications of our results. Uh, one is in structural complexity, showing that the polynomial hierarchy is infinite relative, not just to some oracle, but a random oracle. And the second is a slightly different area in Boolean function analysis, showing that there's no approximate converse to this linear manson nissan theorem on the total influence of constant depth small size circuits. And our main technique is that of random projections, uh, a generalization of the method of random restrictions. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. I've got yet 
another small question. Uh, yeah. Do you think the same kind of approach could work if you uh, augment AC0 with s some other gates? Oh, that's a great question, yeah. Um, yeah, um, that's a great question. I don't really have an answer, but it will be very nice to come up with random projections that simplify exactly as you said. Circuits are more expressive than AC0. Um, it's natural to wonder whether this notion of projections can help, say, to prove load bounds against threshold circuits or something else, yeah. Uh, and again, you can design your random projections so that they destroy these threshold gates, but yeah, I don't have much to say beyond the fact that that's a great question. All results in this paper only apply to AC0 circuits. So, Lian. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. We work at Caltech. We don't see us, but it's yeah. Gil. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Gil. How are you? Uh, thank you. I have a question. Uh, I'm not sure it's quite formal, but what's what's kind of the density of AC0 inside the low influence? Is it is it known? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, what's the density of AC0 inside the low influence functions? Okay. So the first thing is um, sort of. Then it's easy to construct very low influence functions that are not exactly computed by AC0 circuits. Mm -hmm. um, but then I guess the, the, the more robust question is whether low influence functions, they essentially look like AC0 circuits. Mm -hmm. And one way to formalize that is that, you know, here, here's a very concrete conjecture that we can prove <laughs> that every log n influence function is 99% correlated with an AC0 circuit. Right, that sort of says that you know, if you have log n influence, then you sort of look like an AC zero circuit. But we, we feel that that's not true. But one thing I should point out, though, is that our hard ex our counter example, you know, our, our example of a log n influence function that requires large AC zero circuits even to approximate, is designed, it comes from an AC zero circuit. It's the Sipser function scaled down. Right, so the, the broad high level question of, you know, are all low influence functions sort of, do they either come from or do, do they look like AC0 circuits in some sense? I, I think that's still a very interesting question, and I, I don't think our results gives like a 100% satisfactory answer to that. Yeah, but I, I, I cannot even articulate like a formal question um, that would be in the spirit of these like benjamin nicolai schramm conjectures uh, that, that's true and not disproved by our result. Yeah, but I, I sorry, I, I guess I'm not really answering your question, but I just want to say that, you know, anything we can say about the structure of log n influence functions would be, to me, very interesting. And this is, I think, um, these conjectures about converse to LMN, it was an attempt uh, to say something about the structure, that if you have log n influence or if low influence, then you basically look like an AC0 circuit. And we have shown that that's not, that's not true. Uh, but it's, it could still be the case that log n influence have some other structure log and influence functions have some other structure, and I think they'll be very nice. Okay, so Unless there is uh, more questions, we're going to conclude here. Thank you for uh, attending the talk, and thank you, Liang, for the talk. Uh, just as a small uh, statistics thing, we had like we had seven YouTube viewers, and uh, I'm also going to conclude by uh, reminding you about the next talk, which is uh, going to be uh, in two weeks. Uh, Tim Rothgarden will be speaking, and it's going to be one hour earlier than usual. Uh, thanks. Okay, thanks. So we'll stop the broadcast now.